Hey, everybody, and welcome to today's episode. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about how fitness entrepreneurs can separate themselves from the crowd in an oversaturated market. Today's guest is Craig Caverso. Craig Caverso was a former Wall Street oil trader that left that career to go full time into fitness as a fitness entrepreneur. He signed offers, lucrative offers with bodybuilding.com, Cellucore, uh, co founded a fitness technology startup called Metron, and is a franchise owner of Rockbox Fitness. Let's welcome Craig Caverso. What's up, guys? Just here uh, trying to share what I learned over the course of the years. I know we talked to Sig Joe earlier and we have some business relationships, but uh, this is, you know, more of like an informative episode where we're going to just do our best to give you guys some value, uh, share a little bit some of uh, the history that I've had and what I've learned from it. And, uh, you know, maybe you can get a takeaway from uh, what I've learned and what I've, where I've made some mistakes and, you know, get you guys a faster jumpstart on your careers as fitness entrepreneurs and, you know, using uh, some of the tools and technology and marketing tactics that we've used to, uh, you know, get massive success over the years. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's, Craig, I guess, like, let's go ahead and dive deep into, like, your beginnings. Um, let's give people a little, bit of, a, a little bit of a background about who you are and how you actually got transitioned <clears throat> from Wall Street making hundreds, like I assume hundreds of thousands of dollars, a lucrative career and going full time into a career that's known not to make a lot of money as a fitness entrepreneur. Yeah, well, uh, taking it back to uh, 2008 uh, was not the very first year that I started trading. I was actually a couple of years as a clerk on the floor of the exchange in the, uh, the copper and uh, precious metals uh, upstairs. And then um, I ended up clerking for a guy in my last year in the oil markets. And then I was two years into the company that I was clerking for, and I was able to get my rights to trade. So I went on the New York Mercantile Exchange to trade commodities in the derivatives markets as an options trader on the floor of the exchange. So my badge was meat, uh, something that gave me some brand brand name recognition uh, early on. I kind of had this lucrative clear career, uh, you know, is this uh, business guy who, uh, you know, big burly business guy. I used to play football. So I had this like big hulking, uh, you know, body. And, uh, and I kind of got into, you know, boxing. And so there's like a, there, this is a long story, you know, it's, <laughs> I'll do my best to shorten it. But essentially, I played college football. Uh, I was a finance uh, major. And, uh, you know, I turned down my internship with Barnum Financial to uh, do some commercial insurance. Well, come to find out they wanted more experience. So after turning my, my uh, company down, uh, I didn't get the job. And, uh, you know, I was kind of left to you know, fend, for, fend with a college degree, a finance degree, cum laude. I did pretty, pretty well in school and I was a good football player. So I started playing semi-pro football, kept with the fitness and kept that going. And uh, with a career trying to trying to go to the NFL, you know, that's what I was trying to do. But I was also smart and said, you know, I got to make sure that the fitness uh, world or, you know, what I'm, what I'm into, the sports was something that I like to do as well. And, uh, you know, not, and just make sure that I had a career behind me with my college degree that I could fall back on. So I pursued it all. Um, I kind of didn't say no to a single thing and said yes to everything and see where the chips fall. And, uh, you know, I could say that there's some good with that and there's some bad with that and life lessons I've learned, but I would certainly not be where I'm today if I was too timid to take a jump. So I would say, you know, you do have to say yes and walk through some doors to learn um, what what you like and what you don't like, because frankly, there's a lot of what I didn't like. And that's what I had to learn where I could just experience it for myself and then say, okay, well, that was not a failure, but a lesson learned and something I don't want to do anymore. But fast forward to Wall Street. So I'm there as a trader under the badge of meat. It's traded for about eight years. And in that course, I started boxing uh, for some charity events. I amassed a 2-0 uh, amateur boxing record in the New York Metro. And uh, I was under the, the badge or the uh, alias of um, Craig the Hot Commodity because I traded commodities. And, um, you know, I, I started to lose like that football mass and shed some body fat. And so I got into the fitness world and started uh, competing. I uh, competed first in the muscle mania division. And um, I went down into the model universe and did like the, 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 the lower side of the fitness modeling spectrum, if you will. And then, uh, you know, started getting into the other ones. I started doing WBFF and I, I was doing well. I was, I was placing really high, if not winning shows. And I just kept leveling up. And, you know, MPC was the next thing I wanted to do. And so I did WBFF and I took sixth place in the very first muscle model show. I won the, I won the regular WBF or I took, excuse me, I took fourth place in um, the mus. Uh, let's see the WBFF. I don't know. There's two divisions. There's a muscle model and then model or something or whatever their sports division is. Well, I took fourth and one and I was the most ripped and big guy on stage. And the, the guy who uh, ran the show was like, look, you got to do this next category. It's made for you specifically like your body type. 
it was called the muscle model in the WBFF. And so I actually then said, okay, well, I'll do the next one. It was the very next show, jumped down in, in um, Kansas City, and I took sixth place. There was five guys that they turned pro because the very first show when they were trying to get pros in that division, I took sixth. The first five, they turned pro. So I was the last guy out on that, you know, that I was the next guy in line and I didn't get it. So it was like a, a blessing in disguise as I was very obviously hurt by it and it was upset. I did the very next show, which was an NPC. And, um, you know, so I was already in conditioned all ready to go. And I won that show in New York. Uh, I think it was the Atlantic States. And so I won my first NPC show. I went into the Garden States. I won my second NPC show. And then I went to my first national show, the Junior Nationals. And I took, uh, I think, fourth or fifth, something like that in that show. And so I was like, all right, this is kind of a good category. I'm doing well here. And this is the biggest show, right? The Mr. Olympia is part of the NPC organization under the IFBB. So I was like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, you know, sink it in here and, and try to do what I can. So I did the very next national show, which was the, uh, the New York show. Uh, what is it? Uh, I don't know the, whatever the New York show is, I forget what it is and sorry, New York, I used to live there, so I should know this one, but, uh, it was the very next national show in New York and I, I won the show and, uh, you know, I won my category height and I won that side of it. So I turned pro. And, um, you know, the very first year of the MPC had it. So I was a very early on, uh, you know, person in the category. And so I was able to get some recognition early on as having some success. I also was able to get recognition as being this oil trader at the same time. Like I didn't stop oil trading at the time. I was currently doing that literally in my hotel room, uh, tanning myself or having a spray tanner or doing my body. And I was trading in the background or like managing my position or having my clerk who was on the floor, which I used to be, uh, manage my position for me. So I was slash, I was literally a floor trader and, and an IPB pro at the same time. And then that opportunity opened up some other doors. I was currently talking with Cellucor at the time. Uh, they were trying to, they saw me at one of my shows and we had a conversation where they were sending me products and uh, I was making such good money. I didn't say yes right away. You know, like most people just jump on these contracts. I was, you know, I was very self-sustained with my financial career in, you know, the Wall Street that I was just taking my time to figure out which brand I wanted. But uh, it ended up being Cellucor after I turned pro and, it, you know, the deal got right. Um, and I also put myself in line to uh, do the bodybuilding.com spokesmodel search. And uh, I won that as well. So, you know, it was all just things uh, snowballing in the right path. But I was putting myself in a position to say, I'm going to enter this contest and I'm going to see if I can win or make exposure or market myself or and just get out there. And I think the brand story that I had being a Wall Street guy, um, I got fined $250 with chicken in my pocket. So that was something that people were able to resonate with. And, uh, you know, just a lot of things happened that way, but I was able to relate to people that just weren't gym guys or just trainers, PTs in a gym. I was a real guy out in the market doing real finance stuff. And I was able to make a lucrative career, um, you know, getting sponsored by two companies, bodymail.com and Cellucor and, uh, you know, competing in the IPB. So I was able to show people that you can do a lot of things if you put your mind to it and you got to have habits and you got to have a routine and you got to have a system in place. And, uh, you know, I was able to do it all. And unfortunately, um, I did it all pretty good, but I didn't do it great. So uh, that's something we could talk about a little bit. You could be a jack of all trades, but if you're never the master of one, so that's something to consider, but we'll get into, it. I'll let you, uh, I talked a lot. So that's kind of leading up to today. I left wall street. Um, when I saw the kind of writing on the wall, I was, you know, about four or five years into my contracts with the other companies and, and doing well, making some money there started selling online fitness programs as I was just basically downloading, um, you know, to the people what I used to do to get to where I was and the systems I put in place. And uh, Daniel Chen, actually, my co founding partner with Metron reached out to me and sent me a message and was like, dude, I'm trying to, you know, build this platform that basically uses data to personalize results. And, uh, you know, I'm really looking to, you know, get a partner in this or just kind of he just hit me with a message at the right time, because I saw the market and, and Wall Street was getting away from electronic or was getting into electronic trading. So the floor guys were going to become irrelevant at some point. And that's what I was. I was a floor guy. So I said, well, here's an opportunity. This guy's knocking on my door. He's a Silicon Valley engineer. I had just sunk twenty to thirty thousand dollars into another app that I was building called Macrojack that was going to help coaches build their, um, you know, their coaching programs out to people. And it's kind of like a MyFitnessPal, but specifically geared for coaches. And uh, I said, well, I need my tech team. I need somebody who knows something and someone who's close to me because I was just getting consultants and I was getting ripped off, frankly. And so I said, well, I'm going to jump. I'm going to, I'm going to take the career that I had started while on Wall Street. I'm going to sell out my Wall Street position. And I did that at flat. I was able to get out of it, take some good money and, and go uh, start a career as an entrepreneur out there. And I was already doing, I was already making money, like I said, as a coach and being a bodybuilding.com sponsored athlete. So I did have a little nest egg going on, 
but uh, you know, it's certainly a big career move. Went from New York City all the way to California right after I got married. So um, you know, a lot of things happened there. Had a daughter, at, uh, you know, she's five years old now. But while I was out in California with the team, you know, I just had my kid, and I was like, I got to get this girl closer to family. And I had some family in Tennessee, which is currently what got me here. And uh, while I was here, I took another opportunity that was presented to me when I was I'm the VP of business development and co-founder of Metron. And what I was doing at the time was to um, look for, you know, opportunities to market and sell. And we were coming up with the model to like franchise online marketing uh, or franchise like the fitness entrepreneur, the coach. And I started looking at like the brick and mortar models, F45, Orange Theory. Um, and uh, I came across Rockbox Fitness. And my brother-in-law actually was one of the guys and I just wasn't ready to commit to him by himself. But once he partnered up and leveled up his game and what he had, I tried it out and compared the model and I fell in love. So I bought into the franchise and uh, I, got a, I got a brick and mortar store here in Murfreesboro or gym and I bought the rights to two more. So, you know, I'm currently doing a lot. I'm juggling as, the, as a co-founder of Metron VP and business development, help coaches develop their programs. Uh, I do help the coaches at the gym and, and I do teach some classes there and I still m run my own online fitness business as well. And I do a little bit of uh, speculation trading on the side, not really in the commodities, but, uh, you know, in the market as well. So I got my hand in a few different baskets, but that's currently uh, up to speed to where I'm at today. And I run a podcast, sorry, I should say, and I run a <laughs> podcast velocity. So uh, I'm never shy on doing a lot of things, but, uh, you know, it's probably a curse uh, more than it's a blessing, I would say in some in some capacities, but we'll get into that in just shortly. I mean, it's a curse, but I mean, at the end of the day, what, what you've done for yourself is you've built these different streams of income and that allows you to work on your own time and do what you're passionate about. Um, but I, I actually, I kind of want to take it back to your story on how you actually took it step by step and, and got into fitness. Um, it's interesting. You took a different approach than most people. Most people take the approach of creating content, becoming these YouTubers, posting on Instagram and becoming, trying to become an influencer. But you, you, you took the opposite approach. You went and found where the attention was. You weren't trying to pull people in. You just showed up in front of the people at the competitions. Um, like you started competing, you got the attention when like there weren't many people competing. You were an early adopter. Um, <clears throat> I kind of want to go into like you had this idea of why you you wanted to go into the fitness space, but why didn't you go the traditional route of going into social media, like becoming YouTuber or like creating like social media content for Instagram? Why did you go that route for competing? Well, it's not that I did not. It's that, um, you know, I had my career going on. So, you know, I had my nose up in the air, frankly. <laughs> uh, I, I kind of looked down upon the industry, if, if you want my honest opinion. You know, I was doing so well and I thought I was going to be in a career in Wall Street and that's all where I was going to make my money that I didn't have to make money in the, the market. It was literally, it was almost like a gift, you know, my time and effort that I was giving it to it. Um, it when I started off, I didn't do it to make money. I did it because I was passionate about it. And so I think that's what separates me from most people is that, um, you know, it was just a passion of passion project. And that's what I wanted to do. That's what I love to do. I competed as a football player and I lost that drive to continue to do that. It just got so hard and challenging playing semi-pro competing uh, or, you know, trading, I was literally trading in New York City early, early on, and then taking a bus uh, to New York or New Jersey or Massachusetts to go join my team on the weekends, which was crazy. And so once, uh, once that became more of a career, more of a job, you know, to play football, once my hobby became a job, I was done. And so then I moved on to something else that was stated as a hobby and stated as a passion project. And so when I was making good money on Wall Street, you know, I started writing programs and, you know, I was giving away for, you know, a couple bucks, but, you know, I was still doing it and I was sponsored by bodybuilding.com. I was getting out there and look, I played football and I've been immersed in football. I had many coaches and, you know, I'm not certified. Like most of these guys have all the certifications in the world, but I got the experience that most of these guys don't have. I've literally been through it, you know, blood, sweat, and tears. I've, I've put my time and effort in, you know, from when I was 12 years old, I started lifting. I'm 39 right now. I've never stopped. The only time I was sidelined was I had a fracture in my skull and I broke my hand at one point. And literally like a week after I broke my hand, I was in the gym with like a, a wrist wrap on figuring out how to lift. Um, you know, so I've just been in it, you know, it's just passion for me to, to do fitness and I've been certified in nutrition recently and doing some other things. So I am leveling up my education, but to answer your question, why, why did I take that route? Um, I kind of, like I said, I wasn't really trying to do what other people were trying to do in it. You know, these guys, most of them, you know, were just PTs at the time. A lot of the people in the early industry, in the current industry are these guys that either 
didn't go to school or chose that PT was their career or, you know, I'm not looking down on them by any means, you know, that's their passion project. That's what they love to do. You know, unfortunately, it's just not really lucrative unless you can scale and make money, you know, via the online market for the most part, unless you're really just a high priced personal trainer uh, trading your time for money, which I don't like doing. I don't like paying myself for hourly. You know, I like to scale my time. I read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad early on when I was in the mortgage business early before Wall Street. And it was all about scale. How do you make money while you sleep? And that's really the motto that I've, you know, uh, I've, I've built my whole career around. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, th- that's interesting that you say you built it off of passion first and you didn't want to get burnt out. Like you said, football, you became burnt out on. And it's very important that you keep it as a passion, like keep it passionate so you don't burn out on the business side of things. But what do you recommend to like all those people? Like you said, a lot of people start off in the PT <clears throat> space. They go into it as a career and a job. What do you recommend for them like to actually keep that passion alive and be able to go full-time into a fitness entrepreneur? Because I know a lot of these PTs have multiple side jobs as well to keep the bills going. Like w- what are some like recommendations you do have where they're able to scale? Like you talk about scalability, where they're able to scale their time and effort and keep that passion alive rather than getting burnt out, trading that time for money. Well, I would just tell them to self-reflect. You know, I just posted about smart goals, you know, um, and basically, you know, really just honing in on what is your, what are you looking to achieve? You know, at the end of the day, are you just trying to be the next, uh, you know, fitness star who's like, you know, just like a, a silly clown who does stuff for likes on Facebook, or are you actually literally trying to change people's lives? It's like, I think you need to, to come up with a distinction. Are you a PT and you really care about helping other people? Or are you looking just for Insta fame? You know, there's a big distinction in our industry. There's a lot of people that are just, you know, doing a lot of different things for likes and, and, and sh- you know, TNA, you know, they're always shirts always off. And, <clears throat> Not to say that there's not a time and place for some of these things, um, but what it, at the end of the day, I would ask you specifically, if we had the conversation and I did this a lot, like at the expos, I was literally known for the guy of like anti-fitness, like most of the guys at the expos, you'd go in line and you talk to them and they just pump you up and just blow you on anything you want to hear. Literally, they just be your like your cheerleader. I didn't, I, I like stop people in their tracks and just like said, hey, dude, why? What's your why? What do you want to do? What is going on in your brain? Why do you want to, be, yo, I want to be like you? Why? What does that even mean, be like me? Do you want to take the weird career that I took to get here? All these stops and roads and speed bumps and doors open, doors shut, failures, the uncertainty in the market, the times I'm arguing with my wife because we were trying to make ends meet. I mean, I didn't always have, you know, money. There was a lot, a lot of stress, a lot of movement, a lot of uh, risk and uh, assessment that we had to go through. So like, do you want that life? Or are you willing to just put a nine to five and make your money party on the weekends and call it a day, get your get yourself a, a woman, a couple kids and, and be like, Yeah, I'm an American. That's it. What's up? Or do you want to struggle? Do you want to work 80 hours a week and for that time for later? So like, you know, there's there you definitely need to figure out what are you willing to sacrifice to get to where you want to go first. Mm-hmm. So before we even talk about how we can help somebody, it's literally a self-reflection process with the folk and say, hey, what do I want? What am I willing to do to get there? How much money am I willing to put into it? How much sacrifice away from the loved ones or family or um, you know, friends am I willing to do to get there? Because there's a whole time away from everyone that you care about in order to get to your goals, whether that's filming, editing, uh, you know, just being consistent in you got to understand, is there, at the end of the day, does that make you happy? And, uh, you know, at times I'm very happy and at times I'm not. And, you know, sometimes I'm like, man, I want to be over here. And sometimes I want to be over here. And so I have a, a choice now. I have like four different businesses in four different places where I can spend my time and, and I can get myself into a groove and and fulfill uh, my current goals, etc. But you know, I would say to help folks out because I sound like a hot mess just listening to myself and playback here. Um, get real specific about the goal, the thing, the why, the one thing that separates you in your passion, and then do that. Find out how to be lucrative with that thing. And if that's coaching for you, then that means you got to self educate, you got to follow and emulate other people that you like. Uh, you got to produce content. You got to you got to get people results. You can't just post silly pictures of yourself working out because it's the end of the day. Who does that really help? That might help some dude watching you behind closed doors, voyeuring on you. 
uh, cause the girls aren't going to watch you if you're a guy and same thing with a girl. There's a lot of jealous girls out there watching these girls and eating cookies in the background. So <laughs> we got to figure out who you really are. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so basically what you did to like separate yourself from the crowd is you out provided value. Like you straight provided more value than anyone else. You were passionate about it. So you just, all you cared about, you weren't, you, there were no strings attached. You just provided as much value as you could, um, as much information as you could. And then that just grew your following at the end of the day. But I mean, like, <clears throat> like you're right about it. Like most people want the end result, but they don't want the process that comes along with being an entrepreneur, a fitness entrepreneur. They don't want the late nights. They don't want like, like the low bank balance. They just want that end glory, that image. And that's, I, in my opinion, that's where I, I see most people fail and don't succeed is they try to just sell a certain lifestyle without actually having gone through the process and being successful at it. Um, so, yeah, like, uh, so Joe, let me, let me jump in right there. If you don't mind, um, yeah. think about this. Like if you, if you worked like, you know, for a company, like a big company, right? You're a grandfather, for instance, they worked with like these bigger corporations uh, and they worked their way up. If you were a medical school doctor, you put your time and effort into school and, and built these things up. And at some point you grew your practice. And then there was marketing these things that you probably weren't schooled on, but you had to get yourself aware of. So there's a whole marketing side of this conversation. But most people today, young millennials and people of, you know, generation Y or Z or X or ABC, I don't know which one we're at at these days, but most people these days want instant gratification. And that because we have the cell phone that's so easily accessible to access information. It wasn't like that when I grew up. You know, there's a library and there was these other things. The modem on, on the internet when I was like in the, my teens was dial up, man. It was like, you know, we grew up in a different time frame. So like we knew that there was a delayed gratification. So if like there's a test I'm like doing with my kid now to see if there's a delayed gratification because the kids that can delay their gratification mm -hmm. are going to do better off in the world. It's the kids that are just like, you know, are, are having their issues that they need it now. And they're going to be always set up for failure. So like whatever you're doing, whatever we're, we're giving you as advice, just like know that your goal's a long way away, okay? And mm -hmm. set yourself up for some kind of journey to get there. And try to like the journey to get there. Because if you're always focused on the result, that's like, for example, you're watching the score of a basketball game, but you're not doing the plays. If you're always looking at the score, you're never going to run the system or the plays in order to get to the win. So don't always look at the outcome. Am I there yet? Am I there yet? Am I there yet? Actually go with and say, okay, mile marker number one, what did I accomplish? Great. Give myself a pat on the back. Mile marker number two, how am I going to level up? And three and four and five and six. So find out these little splices that you can to get to your goals and modify them and break them down into small chunks. That's what you got to do. So if you want to be an entrepreneur and you want to win, you got to break things down into small specific things. If you're going to be you know, somebody in the online fitness market, you better know marketing. You better know sales. You better know copywriting. How do you get there? You can hire somebody if you got the funds or you better start educating yourself. There's YouTube that there's plenty of people out there. There's small little bits and pieces of information, or you could just get a coach who can help you get to that point. You can get a technology partner. There's a lot of different ways to get to their end result faster, but most often it comes with some coin and what you're willing to, in order to spend, influence your time, read, etc. cetera. But uh, if you think it's just going to happen because you, uh, you know, click the button, bought the right program, got the ebook that's going to tell you it all. It's not going to happen that way, man. I could tell you right now, it takes, it's a grind and you got to be willing to do it. It's got, it's got, you got to have, um, be you got to have passion and you got to have a uh, grit, man. That's, that's it. The word's probably grit to be a fitness entrepreneur grits, the term, and you got to do things right. And sometimes, sometimes some people just pop off because somebody saw them and they went viral some way. And you're like, how the hell is that guy over there or that girl over there popping off, but me over here is not. And I would say, remove the thought, just keep doing it. Just continue to show up every single day and your time will come. Uh, just keep grinding, keep putting out great information, keep putting out the content, keep growing your business, keep educating yourself and it will happen because you're passionate about it and all you're doing is leveling up your passion. If you thought it was a job and you're looking for this end result, you're going to be burnt out faster than you know what to do. And it's just going to waste a lot of time and money. Yeah. And, and absolutely. And that's the secret is you hit it right on the, like right on the dot. The secret is being patient and all the people that have been able to stand up from the crowd and make successful careers as fitness entrepreneurs, whether it's you, Christian Guzman, Jeff Nippert, or all these people, they were patient and they didn't try to sell. They didn't try to have that end image we're talking about, like just 
sell people on products and stuff, they provided as much value as they could because they knew it was a long process. They were patient with the process and they were passionate about it is the key. And then like they just worked day in, day out repetition and kept putting in the work to provide as much value to like their audience as possible. And that's the reason they succeeded. Um, so let's kind of like go into the tactical side of things. Like you said, the, like you mentioned different tactics like copywriting and um, different aspects of marketing. Like, what do you recommend for people out there that are trying to become full-time fitness entrepreneurs? Do you recommend them like go full into the sales aspect or do you like, I honestly think the best thing you could do starting off as a fitness entrepreneur is building brand, building that brand equity, providing as much value and sell last. Um, what are your thoughts on how people should go about become like building that brand equity. Well, if you're listening to this podcast, I'm going to share a link with you guys, hopefully you kick it. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to get a kickback if you buy the course, but I, bu I bought this course, um, one funnel away. Um, and I thought it was great. It was Russell Brunson's company with click funnels and they give you just so much marketing, uh, exposure. You know, how are these guys making money? There's a lot of people in the industry that have these sales funnels and these different things. So, um, to answer the question, look, you got, if you want to be online right now, you got to know how to actually close deals online. You know, if you want to be an online personal or a fitness personal trainer in a studio, then you got to know that market. And maybe you don't need Russell Brunson or ClickFunnels or those things. You need to just basically be a real super personal person and work on that charisma and that character in person. It just depends on where you want to do your thing. If you need to be speaking in front of an audience, like some things that I'll be working on a TEDx that I'm, uh, you know, putting my goals and sights on, you know, you got to know how to, you know, have a conversation with people and talk to the masses, do these podcasts and share your value. So like, again, you just want to locate where you want to have impact. That's the first thing. What impact and what's my audience? Who's my avatar? Once you have an avatar, then you have to have a defining statement. Why if I'm the ideal customer, why should I buy from you? If you can define that statement, that's the one statement that ever, ever, ever matters. Why am I, if I'm the ideal customer, why should I buy from you? If you can answer that statement right there, you could sell anything because you're basically going to find a market. And it doesn't matter if you're selling duck whistles or you're selling fitness programs. There's a market for you out there. You just got to find out which one you want to target, who's your avatar, and answer that definitive statement. So I would say sales, marketing, copywriting, if you're going online, you're going to have to speak to volumes on all three of those things. And I thought the course from ClickFunnels was, was $99. It was well worth the coin. So feel free to uh, click the link and Again, like I said, I'm going to get a kickback in full disclosure, but I think it's well worth it. I'm not doing it for the money. I'm literally doing it because I would have paid probably $500 for it or more, uh, you know, the value that I get and the continuous value that I could go and continue to reflect back to it. So I'm a big fan of those guys. I wasn't doing that at all up front. I was doing like a Wix website, just throwing up some cheesy stuff and just being like, think, hey, I'm cracker person. I'm going to sell stuff. Uh, or basically, I'm just going to sit here and if people want it, they can get it. If not, so like I, I definitely, I pirated the early part of my career. I had so many things going for me. I had momentum. I was doing 30 days out the uh, bodybuilding.com uh, 30 days out extreme trainer that I had. I had millions and millions of bodies and eyes and views on my stuff. And I literally just blew it. So uh, I, I sabotaged the early part of my career. So I'm trying to make up for it on the backside of the stuff now. But um, with fitness, you asked some things earlier, you know, how do you market yourself on social media and these other things? I also sabotage careers then, you know, back in the day, there was like, if you follow me or, or shout out, shout for shout. I never did those. I was like, I'm not going to do a circle jerk. I'm just not going to sit around a circle with people and be like, Hey, if you follow me, I'll follow you. Uh, or if you shout me up, I'll shout you out. Like I literally had some of the biggest names in the industry. I, I'm not even going to call them out right now, but like literally people with like four or five, 6 million followers right now were on my, my Rolodex. And we were, we were having conversations. And I'm like, well, I'm going to be more strategic about it. Like maybe we'll share a post together and we share a tip, but I'm not really just going to say, Hey, follow my friend, because I thought that was so stupid. But had I done that, my followership would have been way up because I would have played ball with the game. So I was, I was very much uh, in my own little element and, and it, it didn't work out, you know, if I wanted like fitness stardom, but I had my morals, I had my compass and I know what I was trying to do. And I'm still passionate about the industry and I'm still making an impact. So essentially I'm doing really good, you know, as far as uh, the career path that I chose, um, I just could have possibly influenced more of these early young bucks um, on that Insta Instagram and social media game and YouTube, et cetera. But uh, it was not something I was willing to do early on, so. Yeah, it's actually interesting that you say that. Um, as you know, I followed you uh, for many years before I like actually uh, got to know you, but I actually came across 
I came across your content uh, briefly on bodybuilding.com, but it kept getting reintroduced to you because you did end up being on other people's vlogs. Um, I don't know if you knew it or not, like Steve Cook, uh, Chris Gethin, but you were actually on their vlogs. And that's what kept bringing me back to you. Like that story about how you were able to manage fitness and uh, entrepreneurship and business together. So, uh, I mean, like, like you said, that, that may have been a huge missed opportunity or not, but I honestly think cross pollinating and getting collaborating with other creators in the space in your area can provide massive growth. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and you said it too, cross pollinating, but providing value, not just like I said, you know, and I don't think it will work today. You know, I know that there's like, you know, the shout for shout, I still get some of those every now and again from like now brands, like literally they're like, there's a company that does shout for shout. Hey, do you want, and, but you got to like pay a buck for some celebrity in, in the game to like shout you out. And so, um, show up with people, YouTube collaborations, those are still gold, man. And that's mm -hmm. probably a way to like, you know, do something, show up on a podcast like we're doing right now and uh, jump in on, on my DMs and just say, Hey, this is who I am. And if you're someone spectacular, then maybe we could have a conversation and I can highlight you and, you know, whatever network that I currently have, which I pirated isn't great anymore, um, can get exposed to you. But like, that's how you do it. That's how you do grow on social media is cross pollination with other people that you influence um, or that are of influence. And then you guys share the same kind of following and then you continue to grow and provide value and be something different. And, but again, answer that question. And it's okay. If you're like, look, I'm sitting in the back room and I'm just Joe and you know, I love fitness and you know, my, my physique is whatever. Um, there's something in you that someone wants to hear from. So like, don't ever count yourself out because you're not a cracker person and this crazy weird story. Like, yeah, I got a story, but you know, I got a thing that some people like and some people hate. Um, so just know that there's a market for all of us and it's big enough world for all of us as well. You know, the fitness industry on the real is like two to 3%, um, you know, especially the, like the gym, you know, they were doing a, a study with all this data stuff during COVID and they found like the actual amount of people that go to a gym is like under 3%. If you understand that 83% of folks actually sign up to a gym and don't go past the second week, mm -hmm. that's the statistics. So like the industry is quite small uh, when it comes down to it, but you have the chance to meet somebody who's sitting on the couch eating potatoes or something, or just like, there's so much, there's so much potential out there that we could tap into. So whatever it is that you've experienced, share your story, share your journey, share your struggles, share your, your successes. Somebody might want to hear it and might want to hear about you and, and willing to give you a try. So if you're this fitness entrepreneur that feels basic you know, continue to be basic as best you can. And eventually you're going to level up into something really special. Yeah. And I actually just want to elaborate on that a little bit more for everyone out there. Like the story is the gold and that is your brand. Like the story is why people connect with you. And without the story, you will, you can't grow as a fitness entrepreneur and a brand. Like you could look at any single one of them out there. Every single person had a story that connected with people. Craig connected with people on the biz, being able to juggle family life, business and everything together. Like he had his own story and people were able to relate with that. Uh, Vince Delmonte, a huge name in the fitness industry. He had the story about being the skinny guy savior, being able to relate with people, that pain point, um, and then take them through that journey and say, hey, I've been in your shoes and I could show you the way out. Um, so the, the story is the brand that you're trying to build. Like Craig said, once you have that story, once you have that message, go cross pollinate, go collaborate and provide as much value as you can around that story or that topic you're talking about with other creators, you get exposure to their brands and like their entire network of followers, people are going to find you. That's how I found Craig. That's how I found like 90% of people that I found and follow and admire in any kind of space I find through cross pollination. Um, so I, so I kind of want let me, to like, let me circle on that. Don't feel, don't feel silly about messaging somebody. Have no shame, right? Because like you could send a message and it can go nowhere or it can go somewhere. So you have a shot and it's a numbers game. Some of these guys got their nose stuck up in the air like I was back in the day when I just didn't care about fitness. And it's not that I, didn't, I was stuck up, uh, you know, I'm calling myself out. I just didn't, I didn't value the fitness market at that time because I was making so much money in another place. So it was more about where I valued my time and effort and money. Um, but you know, this, this is a big business. I've seen a lot of my friends make a lot of money here. Uh, we've made money in the market, you know, Martron's doing some things and changing some names. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're doing some things here where, you know, there's, there's, 
there's opportunity is I guess the best way I could say it, but message the people that you feel um, are special to you um, or that are like you. And you never know if you pick up one or two here, then you picked up one or two, then keep doing that. And it's going to be that circle and compound effect that you're going to get. So continue to just work every single day and grind, but uh, don't look for that instant gratification. Some people have it. Some people got that thing, that it factor that someone just likes and it just pops off. But uh, you know, those, those are outliers. We can't, we can't consider ourselves outliers, no matter how special you think you are. Um, you got to be willing to put in the work. Yeah. So what are some tactics you like have for some people on how they could make that transition? So you talk, you talked about sales funnel and putting in the work to learn marketing, learn these tools for a sales funnel. People in the fitness industry, people are trying to do so many things at once. Like you said, some people are trying to sell merch, uh, fitness programs, supplements, nutrition guides, and all this. What's your recommendation to people trying to do all of this all at once? Do you recommend they focus down on one area and yeah. build a sales funnel and that? And then on top of that, second, second half of the question is, when should people diversify their income source? Um, as someone like you, you have multiple sources of income. When is it okay? When do you feel okay? Like, okay, now I have this settled. When can, now I could go develop a new source of income. Yeah. Um, Vince Del Monte put something out, I don't know, a couple months ago, a good, good guy to follow in the industry. He's also wicked smart. He does some coaching businesses and different things. Uh, he's in that whole sales funnel business and he's been doing this thing a long time. And he mentioned, look, you can't diversify until you have one product that's doing like 80 grand. Uh, I think that was the number he gave. And, and I think he's right. And it's not that it's going to be doing 80 grand once it's 80 grand all the time. Uh, so once you have a consistent thing, a reoccurring revenue stream where you're making $80,000 with a specific product, uh, then I would say it's possibly time to level up and build some more. Um, you know, some people have gone much bigger than that. Some of these superstars have had one product that's made them millions of dollars. But, you know, I'd say for some of you guys, stick to the game, uh, find out if it's the good program, then it's a good program for somebody, then keep selling that one good program. And I know that you want to continue to market and sell to the person who bought you the first time, right? Like that, that was my thought process. Okay. If I gave them this 30 day program, they're going to need something after the 30 day program. So I created a 60 day program for the reverse diet. So I did that. Um, so maybe you have a couple programs and that's a cool thing that we have at Metron. It's like a, a subscription service where you can continue to build um, and elevate like this, uh, this fitness uh, suite. Uh, of different things that you might have, but you should not deviate the, um, the strategy. So if you're a fitness trainer, be a fitness trainer, be a great fitness trainer and make money in fitness up to the level of sustainability and reoccurrence. Okay. Once you have that, then you could say, okay, well, maybe now I got to sell my brand, uh, the merch that you're mentioning. Okay. Maybe then you want to do that because at some point you're going to come to these these places where you're going to deviate effort and energy into this thing that may be a hit or may be a miss. And I could certainly say that I did that and I'll explain to you what I did and how I lost $4,000 and it was the worst investment I made and good thing it was only $4,000, but I have long hair. I always have long hair for the most part. And what happens when you have long hair and you work out, you need something to keep that out of your face. So I, I like bandanas. So I used to wear bandanas all the time. And so, so a product that worked for me, I thought was going to work for everybody. Everyone's going to wear bandanas, right? No, no, not at all. Um, so I put this bandana on and I actually got even slick with it, right? So like if you have a bandana on, a lot of times the tuck in the back of the bandana will fall out of the knot where you're going to tie it in if you're especially going to do that with the pull them on the side. Well, I was like, well, that's silly. I got this big head. Well, I'm going to actually offset the, the logo where the top covering is like two inches past the thing. So therefore, like it was like a like an off bandana. Well, I gave this bandana to some, one of my good friends, an IFBB pro, real popular today, uh, Anton Amp Antipov. And uh, <laughs> he put the thing on and was trying to give me a share. And, you know, he liked it. It was like really good quality bandanas, even though I lost a ton of money on them. Um, they were like stretchy material. They're really, really good. But the dude just put it on and was like wearing it. And the, the logo was upside down because if he didn't, he didn't do the fold right, but I didn't send it with like instructions saying, Hey, you know, so it just, you just normally fold the bandana like a sandwich, put it on. Well, stupid me, you know, I, a, I didn't educate and, uh, you know, I spent a bunch of money on a product that's really good for me, but most people didn't really care for bandanas. So I, I lost my shirt on that product. So there's other things you could do, especially if you're going to test market merch, drop ship. 
find out if your brand has a market, find out if there's a, if people like what you got, if you even have, uh, you know, uh, uh, an audience that's willing to, to invest in you. And uh, there's ways to do that really small with some of these other companies like uh, Printful and other these drop shipping companies where you don't spend any money. Basically, you do a couple print tests up, up in the beginning and, or you don't even have to do that. You could just you could just basically sell their merchandise and make a cut on it. Basically, you would purchase it. Um, you know, every time it gets purchased from your your store, you purchase it on a credit card, but you're already charging somebody, you know, whatever percentage of the retail price and you're buying it at wholesale. So you instantly make money. So there's a way to do that too. There's a whole bunch of games out there, but I would say spend less when you can, especially when you're sales marketing testing as well. Don't spend money right away until you you start getting sales um, from some organic sources. When you start sending traffic from a blog or some a YouTube channel, you know you want to make sure that you're test marketing your sales pages because once you start putting money behind them, then it's just like money out the door and you. Hey, Craig, you there? I think you cut out on me. Go ahead and test. I think we lost you, Craig. Um, I'm still you. I'm still here. Okay, there we go. Okay, yeah. Sorry, we cut out for a second. Um, yeah. Um, let's just since we just disconnected, let's just go into like, what do you think people should start off with, <coughs> like creating a product or a service? Like, what should be the first thing? They could obviously do merch or uh, programs. But what's like the biggest bang for the buck that's gonna help them? be sustainable and get that recurring revenue that they could focus on other things? Well, it's your passion first, right? I, so like I said, the first thing you do is if you're like a designer, then you, you design clothing, or you design brands, or you design these things, get yourself on Fiverr and find out what you're really good at. Um, if you're a trainer, then you build programs, you get people results, you get testimonials, and then you market yourself. And so essentially you got to A, test out your product on yourself, hopefully, or your clients that you're currently working with. If it's good enough, don't just put shit to the market. If it's good enough, then start marketing it by getting testimonials from your clients, getting pictures from before and after. You should be doing this with all your stuff. Um, and then, you know, start putting it out there on social media and see if you can get people to buy it from social media first. So organic. Start blogging about it. Get yourself a website or a place or just a good Facebook page where you can have provide these links. Like you don't need a website anymore. I mean, it's it does help, but you know, a good YouTube channel, a good social media channel could convert. At some point, once you do start doing paid ads, um, you could just do paid ads that way. And again, you you can convert them in many different ways. There's you know there's ads that convert right through Facebook, and there's ads that convert on a, on a, a landing page or a sales squeeze page. Mm -hmm. You know, so. I would say the first thing you got to do is test to get a result, to make sure that whatever you're doing, whatever your passion is, whether it's merch, whether it's fitness, um, can get somebody to purchase it. Once you have your first sale, then you work on getting your second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, et cetera, until you feel comfortable enough to putting some advertising dollars behind it. Um, once you're at that point, it's also still good to get that creative, get that content, get that copywriting. And that One Funnel Away course is, is a really good resource, like I said, for cheap. Um, I really haven't found a better per dollar spend on, on return on investment so far. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Agree with you. I think one step before that, that people would have to do that have no exposure to anyone is they just need to put out as much valuable content as possible before you sell. You have to give them that those jab, jab hooks as Gary V says, provide value, provide value, then ask for something in return. Because if you just go straight into sales process, no one's really going to buy from you because they don't trust you that you have no recognition with them. So the main yeah. In, in my opinion, the main thing is build the brand and the culture uh, and give as much value as you can for free with nothing in expectation in return. Yeah. And then as you get that audience, then you slowly start asking. There's nothing wrong with asking for products or sales, but you just have to provide that, that enough value that people trust you and will go into that as well. Yeah. And you and like you just said, and that's a great point, you can actually put a basically a product out for free at the backside and have an upsell. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you're offering them something. Okay. I'm going to give you this gift. I'm going to give you this product. I'm going to give you this ebook, this template, this thing, this 10 steps to whatever it is you want to do. This is the wholesale marketing funnel game, mm -hmm. but you give them something of value that you really like. You're one of your best stuff in hopes that basically it gets them a return on investment of their time. Right now yeah. you're basically selling time because time is precious and where people spend their time is YouTube, is a podcast, is Instagram. And the where people spend their time, if they want to deviate from their current habits to read your stuff, is an investment of their time, which is value. People don't think that, even though giving something free, um, 
you know, I, I don't know how many free things I got, but most of them I didn't read because I didn't value it. It's the things that I usually purchased that actually gave me time to prioritize it. And even those I haven't literally, I've purchased many things that I haven't even touched right now. But morally, what I'm trying to say is that you probably do need a free offer, something of value that someone can experience you if you're especially new to the market and then have another offer that's paid. So if they do want to support, if they do want to get the next thing, um, you can go there. A cool feature we got in Metron is like a 14 day free trial with referrals. So, you know, and then you could do coupons. So there's a lot of different places, tools, et cetera, that you can use, especially if you're online marketing or using, uh, you know, app-based systems like we have to uh, offer somebody something to try you out and then get them to, you know, experience you. And if they want to continue, they can. But uh, I definitely think you need some kind of a low hanging fruit offer where people can invest their time. But just know that you got to give them something good. Don't give them this danky stuff that nobody wants because then they're going to think your whole product is that. Mm -hmm. And honestly, that's exactly what you did at the time when you collaborated with bodybuilding.com and Cellicore 30 days out. The, like, the biggest hit program ever you had, like it had like what, millions of downloads? Um, yeah, or like millions of followers second week or something. I think I got the stats that there was like 1.5 million views on the, on the product. I don't know how many people actually went through, but people that hit that landing page and watched the video 1.5 million in two weeks. Yeah. And that, and that built your brand right there instantly on the spot. Like you gave uh, like bodybuilding.com at that time was free. So all that content, all that programming that went into it was delivered for free and it was tons of value. And after that, people had that trust. They saw the results and then they trusted you and wanted to consume like your content, your programs, and then that excelled you 10, 20 times forward. And that separate, that honestly separated you from the crowd. Cause there's, yeah. there were tons of people trying to be the YouTubers, trying to like flex and like sell this image. Um, but you just out valued them. You out yeah, I did it. I did it pretty, pretty much first too, at the time, like literally that was almost one of a kind. I think Chris Gethin had something similar in the market uh, soon after, or you know, it's close to the same time him and I were doing those live daily trainers that just wasn't a thing that was being done before, mm -hmm. uh, you know, at that time. So I definitely hit that market soon. Uh, and then I actually saw some dude, if you're watching, dude, uh, he basically ripped off my 30 days out, hit his, he did his own transformation. And I think sells it too. So uh, you are, you are infringing on my copyright, but whatever. Good luck. I, I remember that he uh, did the transformation on YouTube yeah. with your 30 days out and then resold that program. Yeah. yeah that's <laughs> right. There's enough to go around. Yeah. He did give me original credit. I'll take that at least. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, I kind of want to go into like some of the secrets um, of the industry since um, you like, like you said, you were like one of the first OGs of the industry and you've worked with a lot of the people. Like what are some secrets that people did that helped them separate themselves from the crowd, whether it's like the daily trainer from Chris Gethin or people going into the YouTube life, like Steve Cook and doing those vlogs, like what are some of the things that help them grow over others? Well, I think the best thing you can do is be consistent. Okay. So like 30 days out for me, there was a day, there was a video for every single day in the program. I think that hooks people. People got to understand who I am. I wish I had the time and effort to do something like that again. And, you know, I might get a little bit more motivated. I actually, I'm filming myself for the last two weeks right now, because I'm working on a planche. Uh, I'm working on literally this planche push-up, twist, planche push-up, like some crazy thing that I, I'm not good at right now. And I gave myself a time limit, et cetera. But um, I think the, 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 the ability to basically show up in somebody's feed daily. So mm -hmm. having a daily post in some capacity, whether it's Instagram and a way in, I give them a video. I give them a, literally a video every single day of my life. So like those live videos right now are money. So like if you can get on there and I know I need to do it more of it, but just having that you being in their ear, you hearing them, hearing your voice, seeing you, watching you interact, they could find out if you're special or not, or if you're just full of it. Um, and so be prepared for people to call you out on your BS, but also have some thick skin because no matter what good, how good you are, someone's always going to find faults with you. So if you are going to step into this game, just know that there's going to be some good and there's gonna be some bad and uh, be prepared for it. Um, you know, other things that I can say besides the consistency and showing up all the time, especially on YouTube, podcasts, Instagram, that's the, that's the keys to growth. Um, you know, getting people, giving value, giving something that other people aren't, you know, um, in some capacity or doing, or, you know, it's, it's tough to be original today. There's so much that has been done. You know, it's, you know, you don't have to be, you know, this brand new, there's, there's, there's not 10 different ways to diet or a hundred different ways to diet. Although you hear a different diet every single day, but just be really good at it know what you're talking about, deliver it in a way that's, um, you know, efficient, uh, well digested, 
and people could resonate with your message. There's someone who's going to hear you and then someone's going to want to hear a doctor. And if you're not a doctor, um, you know, so like just deliver it in the best way that you can and just own it. Just be, 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 be good with your content and just be like, this is me. This is what I got. And if you don't know a lot yet, say that, Hey, I'm just learning. I'm on this journey with you. Well, let's do it together and then grow with them, but just continue to self-educate, grow, you know, level up your tools. If you're using platforms or apps or things of that nature, continue to just provide value and know that there's always another step and just continue to grow and elevate. That's the best thing I can tell you to do is be consistent, elevate your brand, self-educate and adapt. Technology is moving rapidly. Continue to jump on the new platforms and, and gain market share because uh, some people start out and then flame out. Yeah. Yeah. And it's important to know like what like the algorithms optimize. And I mean, based off what you said, it sounded like um, you're talking more about like the realms of video. Do you think video is a medium and creative that's been working lately um, out there or um, does email and all these other marketing tactics work or what's like, do you think, do you think video is the medium to get the most exposure? Well, it's Instagram tough, used right? to because be like not... all pictures, um, pictures and long descriptions, but now I've seen a trend that more, the algorithms are promoting videos more and people are yep. engaged more with those. Yeah, I mean, it's the thing with the video is that it's a way for them to keep themselves. If, if you look at the advertisers, right? So how do you know when a good ad is that people watch the ad? If you're on YouTube, how do those YouTubers get paid? People watch the videos. So if you provide content that's good, entertaining or educational, people are going to stay on your videos. You know, so if you could do those things then stick to video, if you're not good at that, then stick to the medium that you're good at. If you, you got a face that only a mother can love, then don't be on video. Um, you know, just, just write. Um, if you're super hot, <laughs> then do your thing. Um, don't be the TNA person because you're probably going to get a lot of people that are just going to look at you and not really going to buy your stuff. Um, you know, there's a whole nother market for that. And maybe we should be having a different podcast for that. But, um, you know, know where your passion lies and just pursue the best means of your delivery. If you're a great writer, continue to write. If you're awesome on video, continue to make videos. If you love training and you got someone to film it, or if you're willing to, you know, interrupt your sets by setting up your camera all over the place and you want to mess with people in the gym then do that. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of different ways to skin a cat. You got to find out which way works for you. Mm -hmm. Did, do you, um, I'm, I'm curious, do you like uh, put more effort and attention into creating content towards one platform or the other? Well, Instagram's easy, right? Instagram's probably the easiest way to get traffic, but uh, you know, it's so it's so fickle. People are just really just scrolling to be entertained. So, you know, if you're going to be on Instagram, it's really more of an entertainment platform. YouTube, I would say, is probably educational. You could be entertained there too, but I think more people are going on YouTube for education. Um, you know, learning things. Uh, Twitter, you just want to be political and crazy. You could be up there and just get a tweet. I don't think you spend any time there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if you're really good at graphics, you might want to be on Pinterest or these other places that share those things. And you could back, you could backdoor your website um, that way. You know, you got to just find out again, what you really like doing. But um, if you're a video creator, I would say you got to be on YouTube just to be, you know, someone who's going to, you know, create some market share there, get some resources. And eventually if you build up enough audience, you can, um, you know, make some money and monetize, but it's going to take a while. I've been looking at how to monetize recently. I was monetized at one point and then I, you know, I, I kind of let my channel go to spoils and uh, they took me down. But um, you 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 got to find out what you can do. And, and again, the easiest source is to just be consistent. So if that means just posting a picture, a video is something on Instagram or Facebook, start there and then, um, you know, educate yourself into the places where your customers hang out, whether that's in Reddit, whether that's in a blog, whether that's wherever you got, you got to find out where your customers hang out and then cross pollinate. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, I actually want to build upon that. Like the, I, I think the most important thing you could do is figure out where your audience is, like where that traffic is and where your ideal customers hang out. I think a huge platform that's being overlooked by all the fitness entrepreneurs right now is LinkedIn. Uh, I mean, LinkedIn has taken the transition to more of like a content sharing kind of platform. But the good thing about it is if you're like in the B2B space, let's say Rockbox wants to do some corporate wellness events. Well, you could target people based off of their job descriptions and physically put out relevant content or ads in front of the people. So you don't necessarily have to be on a specific platform to grow. They may do more harm than good. If someone's in corporate wellness, they have no need to be on Instagram. They may do it to cross pollinate and diversify their traffic to their Instagram as well to keep them engaged, but they need to be putting more effort into where their audience attention is, which in that regards would be LinkedIn. So I think on like on top of that is 
the key thing is figure out your story, who you are and where their attention is, and then just put in as much effort and be as, as consistent as you can on those specific platforms as you can. Like you said, then cross pollinate and get, get people to all of your platforms to keep them engaged. Right on. Yeah, I think it's well said. And, and it's a great resource, LinkedIn. A lot of benefit there, obviously serious people and usually with people with money or searching for something, um, you know, so, you know, it's a good place to go. Uh, some people that don't have money hang out in a lot of different places and just need to be entertained, but usually LinkedIn are professionals in some resource or some capacity. And uh, if you're in the business of making money, you got to go where the money is. Yeah, actually, I'm curious to what your thoughts on TikTok is, because I, in my opinion, I think TikTok has <laughs> some great organic reach for people that are young fitness entrepreneurs trying to reach that younger crowd. Like, have you, have you dabbled in TikTok yet? Or like, what are your thoughts on that? You know, the problem with TikTok for me I keep, you know, I'm an entrepreneur, so I always click on entrepreneurial type things. And so I get marketed or, or the, my feed is like people like in finance or in, mm-hmm. um, you know, doing these drop shipping companies and all this stuff. So like I'm, I'm getting inundated with ideas. And the problem with me is like the shiny syndrome, you know, uh, stay away from the shiny light syndrome you know, oh, it sounds great. These guys crushing it. Great. How to make money. Oh, awesome. I want to do it. So like, um, you know, my entrepreneurial brain needs to go on Xanax. Like I got to chill out and be like, no, I got like four or five things on my plate right now. Chill out. So mm-hmm. the problem with me for TikTok is that I'm just so inundated by the feed of these people trying to sell something mm-hmm. and they're, they're, rel- they're relentless. Like it's like, you know, Instagram at least is somewhat entertainment value and I can go there and just get lost in entertainment. TikTok, mm-hmm. although if you click on enough entertainment TikToks, you'll get entertained all day. Um, you know, you start clicking on some of these folks that are selling things, you're going to get inundated with that. So like, for me, it's just like a constant commercial, especially when I'm, you know, looking at my feed. So if I don't go looking for specific things, you know, I, unfortunately I'm just like, shit, I got to do that. Oh man, I should do that too. Oh, wow. That that sounds like a great idea. (laughs) Have you Um, thought about putting out content for your brand and your personal fitness (laughs) stuff on there? Yeah. Uh, briefly, um, you know, once in a while. And, And again, if I post it on Facebook, um, or Instagram, then, you know, I should probably do it over there too. And the problem is just learning the tool. Uh, I Mm -hmm. haven't really spent the time to like learn how to properly post something that's entertaining because obviously each platform has its way of, you know, providing a great looking piece of content. Mm -hmm. Facebook has a unique way. Instagram are the squares or the vertical spaces. Um, you know, so in TikTok has all these crazy things with songs that are like super important to their algorithm over there. And like, so there's, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of new for me over there. So it's like, do I want to spend time investing in this platform, which has potential? I think it's, uh, it's quite entertaining. I, I do enjoy my time when I actually remember to go over there, but usually I'm focused on where I'm spending my content or where I'm pushing my content just to see the responses and hopefully not getting myself lost in some kind of a uh, place where I shouldn't be, where I should be focusing on building my business as opposed to taking in someone else's. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, honestly, what, I, what I've done is I, I create multiple, like you said, your feed becomes curated for stuff you're interested in so what i do with like tiktok and social media platforms is i create multiple accounts and just like and engage with the content that i want to see more about and like research and the fitness industry has there's a lot of people experiencing a lot a lot of growth um i mean then i think it's actually it could be very beneficial for you and your brand is just putting out relevant like like you said the most important thing is going to be creating content that's curated for that platform it's specific for the platform because tiktok content facebook content will not work on sorry instagram content or facebook content will not work on tiktok because you have to capture their attention it's in like entertaining content different type of medium so if you have the time and the resources i think it's a great resource for you to get exposure and drive people to your other platforms and get that new younger generation to get familiar with you. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's one thing too, though, just understand it's a younger generation, just like Snapchat, right? So like, if you are pitching uh, to an audience that, you know, might be more mature, then you don't want to be over there. So just know mm-hmm. where, like he said, where your audience hangs out and, and uh, invest time in learning the best means and methods to, uh, you know, engage with that audience. Hashtagging is a thing. Make sure that you know how to properly do that. Uh, which ones go do the Google search or do some kind of, you know, research on which is the best hashtag for your industry and uh, execute that way. Yeah. All right. So I guess to wrap it off, I let's, I want to end things off with a few questions for the audience. What was your biggest failure or mistake and what do you wish you could have done better in your career? Spending money before having 
the right expectations of what it's going to do. Uh, meaning, you know, sounds good. Let me throw some money at it. Uh, great. Let's market that um, without having a test. You know, I should have done a small run of bandanas or done some market. Like there's a, the lean startup model was literally like to create an ad that has no product. So then you only spend a couple hundred bucks on an ad to see if someone's even going to click your product. That's the way you could do it. At the end of the day, then you just don't deliver the product. Oh, sorry, we're sold out. Um, but then you could find out if the test is actually happening. So a lot of different ways before you spend your time and effort is do a test. Um, you know, so I would say some of the biggest takeaways is to have a, to have no product before you even start your product to find out where there's value or where there's interest. You mm -hmm. know, so one thing you could do is before you spend, you know, weeks, months, years into developing this system or this approach, find out if the approach actually sells first. Yeah. Yeah. Find the attention, see what people are engaging with the most and then create stuff around that and if it keeps going well just go all in and then what is one message you want to leave to all the fitness entrepreneurs watching this and want to grow their business consistency is key and the only way you're going to be consistent is like what you do um you know burnout happens be in it for the long haul you know just understand that you know there are people out there that you know got you know start them overnight there are people that you know got uh put their time and effort in uh whether that be you know competing or whether that be, you know, just showed up on Instagram, had a set of abs and just said the right thing at the right time and it went viral. But um, don't look for that type of success. Uh, although it sounds great and it's it's something that most of us want is just to, you know, hit the lotto. Um, speaking of which, I bought a lotto ticket. <laughs> <laughs> I never buy a lotto ticket. I was compelled to do it the other day. Just said, why not? Um, but, you know, look for, look for the thing that you really like doing and that you'd be like, look, I'm happy with this. I'm, I'm continuously okay with, you know, making, making ends meet doing this thing and then find a way to say, okay, I want to make a lot of money doing this thing. And then you can find out how that's possible. Um, especially if you're in the online market, that's the way it is possible. So find a way that you can make some kind of return on your investment so you can make a career. Um, if you have another job and you're doing this as a hobby at first, continue to do that. But don't quit your career until your hobby has actually a profit margin. Um, and you would say, actually, I could leave. Don't do it too early because you're then the stress of entrepreneurship um, is burdensome. I could tell you from firsthand experience, um, you know, make sure that your your hustle has has a, a revenue and has some goals that you can actually pay your bills with, um, you know, prior to you you know, going all in. Cause there are some people that says, look, you got to go all in on your hustle project or, or there's side project. Like there's, you know, I forget the guy's name, but he's like, there is no plan B there's plan A. I don't believe in that, man. Why are, why does everyone have to be stressed out to their mind? You know, be passionate about a project and take the slow road, learn, educate, continue to deliver content and your time will come as long as you're producing good content, being consistent with your content. And, you know, that way you can, you can stress less and a, a less stressed person is going to sell better. Yeah, never heard truer advice, like slow and like, it's like the old rhetoric, slow and steady wins a race. Everyone knows it, but everyone wants it now. Like with mm -hmm. the generation we live in is immediate gratification. Everyone wants it now and they don't want to wait the five years that everyone else did to get that result. Uh, and, and there's a big thing about like the hustle too. Let me just end with that as well. Like hustle is not sexy guys. Like, you know, I know it's really, really cool. And look, there's not many people that have more hours, you know, that work than I do. I literally, I'm one of those career entrepreneurs that just put the hours in and will work when I need to work. Just doesn't matter the time of day, month, year, birthday, I'll just keep working. But there is a time and a place to be very happy and content with your life and, and your impact. And um, don't be sold by these people that's like, look, you just got to just hustle, 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 hustle. Be smart with your time. You know, I'm not saying that you don't have to put the time and investment in and, and work it, but like you also might have a family. You also might have a wife, a kid, um, or want to grow that, you know? So like, just know that there's, there's a time and effort, you know, there's a work-life balance. Make sure you have some of that because, you know, nobody wants to just continue to like, Besides other entrepreneurs that are just in the grind, you know, you're going to attract that. So if you want to be a coach of coaches, then you sure just say that, say the hucks, the hustle sexy, and you'll get people like, yeah, it's awesome. We're working all the time. When do we play? Um, or you could find people that are like, look, I love eating. I love drinking. I love enjoying my life. I love looking healthy. Okay. Well, how can we do all of those things? Like fit for life is what I'm all about these days. And I would say you probably want to join that bandwagon as well, because 
you know, essentially most people in the world, not the, the two, 3% that's sitting in the gym, but the rest of the people that big market share uh, wants to do those things. So if you want to relate to the big market, you gotta, you gotta find out how to talk to them first. Mm -hmm. and, and honestly, like I've, I've seen, I'm seeing a trend in the market, like people are finding the fake people out there. Like they're the cancel culture, right? Like if people are like hustle is not sexy, you need a work-life balance. And there's people have that work-life balance but preach hustle like they don't stop working or they don't sleep and that's absolutely not true you need your rest you need to sleep but it's being transparent about it um and that's being true genuine and authentic with who you are is going to help grow your brand honestly at the end of the day yeah but uh yeah i guess that is a wrap to this episode thank you so much craig for uh being on the show you got it, brother. Uh, anytime. We'll, we'll do more of these. Obviously, we're going to be kicking off our own channel here uh, to help the the, uh, the fitness entrepreneur secrets. So be be tuning into that soon. And you can catch me on the on the on the flip side at the Velocity Podcast or just any of my contact at Craig Perso and Sig Joe. Uh, we'll basically have all the details and that link to ClickFunnels if you want it in the show notes. So uh, just make sure you guys stop by, DM us questions, ask comment questions, whatever you got to say. Uh, we're happy to, uh, you know, spin off some episodes and do some Q&A on some of this stuff as well. If you have some awesome people that we should interview or talk with, certainly let us know.